Well, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out. I uh, apologize for being a little bit late here this morning. Uh, Dr. Sunga is in very heavy demand out in the hallway on, in terms of media. Um, we're very pleased though, we're very pleased and honored uh, to welcome the President of the Central Tibetan Administration, Dr. Lungsai Lung Sungai, here today at Heritage Foundation. This is actually the second time he's been here. He was here uh, about two years ago, a little more than two years ago, hosted by our in-house historian, um, Lee Edwards. Um, and he comes back now at a very interesting time, I think fair to say, in U.S.-China relations. Uh, two years ago, it wasn't clear where we were headed yet. The administration was only about four or five months uh, old didn't know what our policy towards China was exactly. There were a few impulses that we, we, we thought might guide things, but we didn't know for sure. But I think at this point, it's quite clear that uh, the U.S. is engaged in a new era of strategic co uh, competition with China. Um, it's, it's testified to in any number of uh, strategic documents and statements from the administration. And it's very widely shared around Washington on a bipartisan basis. We are certainly entering a new uh, a new era. If anything, in fact, I think those of us, especially those of us that are focused on economic freedom and, 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 uh, and free trade, if anything, we have to restrain a little bit the impulse in, in Washington to lump all of those things together into some sort of uh, showdown, some sort of showdown with the, with the Chinese. We're, we're challenged, I think, to try to keep this competition in some constructive parameters. But those constructive parameters are what today is about. We intend this conversation today to be constructive and to uh, be within the spirit of, uh, of um, continuing uh, positive involvement of the United States across the board in the region. There's nothing new about uh, the authority that Dr. Sungai represents. There's nothing new about the Dalai Lama, in fact. Um, there's nothing new with regard to the amount of respect and appreciation and reverence, really, that the Dalai Lama has held outside of, out of China. There's nothing new about Americans' interest in Tibet. In fact, not to date myself, but I was involved in the drafting of the, of the, um, the Tibet Policy Act as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee staff back in 2000. Two, the purpose of that act was to, quote, support the aspirations of the Tibetan people and to safeguard their distinct identity. That hasn't changed. That's still American interest. And neither has the U.S. official position uh, changed with regard to Tibet that, that is issued by the State Department and the executive branch. So look, we're interested in Tibet's welfare, the culture and safety and freedom of its people. Is that interfering in China's internal affairs? Maybe. But hey, welcome to U.S. foreign policy. That's the way we do things, and that's certainly not changing either. So, so with that, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Sangai. Dr. Lubsang Sangai was elected to the post of Sikyong, the democratically elected leader of the Tibetan people and the political successor to the Dalai Lama in an unprecedented and competitive democratic election among the Tibetan diaspora. Um, that occurred in 2011, and then he was re-elected in 2016. In addition to being the president of the Central Tibetan Administration, Dr. Sangha is an expert on international human rights law, democratic constitutionalism, and conflict resolution. He has a BA and an LLB from Delhi University and an SJD degree from Harvard Law School, the law school's most advanced law degree. Needless to say, this is perfect background for Dr. Sangai's current role. Elected leaders don't always come with this kind of uh, educational background and, and, uh, and uh, connection to their current, uh, their current roles. Um, he does his cause and all of ours very well. Tibet is very fortunate to have him, and we're very fortunate to have him today at the Heritage Foundation. So with that, let me invite Dr. Sangai to the podium to, to open us up. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for your kind introduction and uh, your long association with the Tibet issue. And uh, privileged to be here at the Heritage Foundation in two years' time. And as you know, I'm here only for 48 hours. 
So meeting with senators and congressmen, <coughs> lobbying for the uh, Tibet Policy and Support Act now um, uh, has been going quite strong. In the last two days, I think we met about eight senators and uh, three or four House members. And uh, I was a bit delayed because I was supposed to meet a very influential senior congressman. But then, as it is in Washington, D.C., when the voting takes place, they take seven minutes. And I, wo I waited, and there was a second round of voting. So I had to choose between Heritage Foundation and a very senior influential congressman. And I chose Heritage yeah. Foundation, yes. And because uh, this is my last engagement, and from here I'm running straight to the airport to uh, uh, another place where I have to uh, show up and speak. Uh, but uh, you are in good hands because Mathieu and Olivia will take over after I leave and uh, answer all the questions uh, that I'll share, you know. <laughs> Maybe if I say things wrongly, they will help uh, uh, correct the matter. And over, yes, the topic is preserving freedom in Tibet. It's a very apt topic because freedom is under attack. Um, because uh, having been to many capitals around the world, uh, you can clearly see the Chinese government is trying to restructure the United Nations. And uh, uh, you know, last year they have become the second largest donors uh, to the United Nations after US. And now more uh, funding you provide to the United Nations, the process is more uh, officials or Chinese personnel you can put in various agencies of the United Nations. And that's how the system works. And uh, at the Human Rights Council, we have been knocking uh, doors for many, many years. Uh, but, uh, you know, China, the Chinese government is also trying to redefine uh, human rights. And they have passed two resolutions uh, in the, Uni in the uh, Human Rights Council where uh, essentially, you know, uh, development proceeds over uh, democracy, food proceeds over freedom. So the metrics and measurement of human rights will be such that when Tibetans or the Uyghurs or the Hong Kongers, the Taiwanese or the Mongolians go to the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council, when we say our human rights uh, are violated, so they will ask you, are they giving you enough food? Yes. Are they giving you shelter? Yes. Then they have met the requirement of human rights and uh, you can't complain. So you, know, you can clearly see, but you know, uh, when you are here in Washington, D.C., talking on policies, uh, sometimes you miss this, not small, but very important things that's happening in you know, uh, multilateral agencies where Chinese influence is growing uh, very strong. And uh, I was uh, at uh, uh, Brussels just recently uh, trying to lobby European um, Parliament to establish Tibet intergroup, you know, so 30 or so uh, European parliamentarians have signed up to join the group. But Europe as it is have, you know, 17 plus group. So, you know, Europe, you have around 50 countries and European Union has 28 countries. But 17 countries from European Union and Europe have signed up with China. The plus one is China. They have set up a group within Europe. So Europe is divided now. So there are 17 uh, countries, which in a way, uh, support or side with the Chinese government. And this is very clear because in early 1990s, when you try to move a resolution on human rights uh, of Tibet at the Human Rights Council, you get almost all the European members voting for Tibet and against the Chinese government. Nowadays, among the 17 European countries, when you try to move a resolution at the Human Rights Council, almost all the 17 countries will abstain. So, you know, you have very few allies, uh, even uh, to uh, advocate for uh, human rights and democracy. That way, uh, freedom is under attack. And what you see in Hong Kong uh, uh, proves that point blatantly in, in broad daylight. Uh, you can see uh, violence being inflicted uh, on people, especially youth of Hong Kong, who are asserting their basic human rights and freedom. And what you, you know, uh, hear and read about the uh, situation in Xinjiang uh, clearly proves uh, that freedom is definitely under attack. Now, these two uh, cases uh, validate our point of view. 
and the Tibet Policy Act was passed in 2002. We've been, Tibetans, we have been in the forefront for the last 60 years, especially in the international front for the last 30 years. And we've been going around and telling the international community that such human rights violations taking place in Tibet. And often the countries will say, well, it's a sad case in Tibet, but you are an exception. We can make deals with China. We can do business with China. We can have diplomatic relationship with China. That was mainly the narrative, and that was the approach. Now, with the crisis in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, and especially we should not forget what's happening in Mongolia as well, now it validates our argument. We are not an exception. It's a system you're dealing with. You know, it's the uh, socialism with Chinese characteristic in New Era, which is the global uh, forum where socialism with Chinese characteristic is coming. Hence, for all these years, you know, if you go through the list, um, let me quickly go through the historical relationship between Tibet and China. I'll come to the point where, you know, for the last 30 years, the argument has been, we, let's transform China. China. China will be transformed, you know, with the middle class, with business relationship, and then there will be democracy and freedom in China. That was the thinking. Now, 30 years, we realized that we are not transforming China, but rather China is transforming us or making efforts to uh, transform us. If you go, go way back, because this is heritage foundation, so we must preserve and know the heritage, you know, of Tibet-US relationship. In 1943, um, American government wanted to provide supplies to Kumintang government. And uh, President Eisenhower sent a watch and a letter to His Holiness Dalai Lama. And he was very young. I think he was eight or nine years old. He was very, very excited to receive the gift, not the letter, which is more important, but the watch. You know, He still has the watch, and he shows his watch from time to time. Uh, and then at that time, to prove our point, that we did not allow, at that time, American government to use Tibet as a route to supply arms and ammunition, whatever, to the Kuomintang government. You know? So that establishes the fact that Tibet was an independent country, that we could deny uh, permission even to the United States uh, to supply uh, to the Kuomintang government. And uh, uh, later, when Tibet was invaded and uh, in 1950s, in 1959, when it became very critical that uh, you know the arms and you know violence will be used in Lhasa, uh, as per the military archives of uh, China, from the month of March to September of 1959, 87,000 Tibetans were killed. Right. So just before all this happened, His Holiness had to flee uh, from uh, uh, Tibet along with 80,000 Tibetans. Now, this is very important. In 19, by 1956, there was some contacts, especially with CIA and Tibetan guerrillas. They, and at that time, guerrillas was not set up, but some uh, training was given, and they could use the telegraph system. You know? And uh, two of them were part of the group or the entourage with His Holiness Dalam escaping from Lhasa to India. So President Eisenhower, uh, uh, being from, I, we have someone from Eisenhower Institute here. So being from a military background, he was interested as to where was his Solonist Dalai Lama because he left uh, uh, Tibet Lhasa in the midnight of March 17, 1959. So from March 17, uh, March 17, 1959 to March 30th, no one knew where he was. So he was, you know, uh, traveling towards India and uh, if you read his Solonist biographies, even Tibetan group w was not so certain where they were going, whether they were going to India. India was their first preference, or to Bhutan, or the third option was even Thailand. You know? But there was no uh, clear indication where uh, they should go. As per our, we are Buddhists, as per the divination, uh, India was the destination. So the you know, oracle showed, said you should go to India. You know, so that was the directive, and based on the oracle directive, his Holiness uh, group went. But every morning, because there were two CIA-trained, you know, uh, uh, Tibetans who could send telegraphs to Washington D.C., so President Eisenhower would come to the office and say, "Okay, where is Dalai Lama this morning?" So because he's from a military background, he had this, you know, uh, map, and he used to put pin every morning for 14 days. You know, he used to put put pins, 
And uh, he also called uh, Pandit Nehru, who was the Prime Minister of India, that His Holiness was in fact coming towards uh, India and to provide uh, refuge. And uh, obviously, Pandit Nehru was uh, willing by then. So that's one part where you know American president was directly involved. And then uh, John F. Kennedy, President uh, Solonis Dalam wrote to uh, President Kennedy in 1960, December 29th, because by then he was in exile in India as seeking uh, American support. And at that time, uh, with the help of American government in 1959, 60, and 65, three resolutions were passed in the uh, United Nations General Assembly. And uh, of these three resolutions, one supported self-determination for the Tibetan people. So uh, President uh, Kennedy played a major role. And later, we all know his uh, brother, Edward Kennedy, became a best friends with His Holiness Dalai Lama. So it was uh, uh, to His Holiness credit that whenever he came to Washington, D.C., he had uh, Senator Jesse Hems on the right, and the Senate Kennedy on the left, you know. <laughs> so only person who could bring the right, uh, right wing and the left wing of Washington, D.C. to one podium was His Holiness Dalai Lama. And then uh, His Holiness also was given the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award in 1998. And then we all know that part of history. Kissinger's traveled to China thereafter Nixon. That changed the whole uh, narrative and the landscape of geopolitics, you know. Uh, so even though Russia, Soviet Union was also communist, but China was also communist, communists of China was preferred option uh, uh, over uh, Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, that led to uh, the major changes in uh, you know, American government policies towards, uh, uh, towards Tibetan people as well, generally, <laughs> but towards Tibetan people. The aid and the supplies that Tibetan militia used to get in the Mustang of Nepal abruptly ended, um, and uh, aid and other uh, political support we used to get also ended. Then President Jimmy Carter came, and uh, of course, uh, he was an advocate of human rights and democracy. And then President Reagan, obviously, he famously said, bring down the wall uh, on uh, 1987, June 12th in Berlin, but not much on Tibet uh, directly um, and, uh, and, uh, and China. And then George H.W. Bush, um, he was pioneer in the sense right after Tiananmen Square, you know, uh, all the Chinese students who were studying in America were given uh, asylum, so to speak, or political asylum. And uh, accordingly, 1,000 Tibetans were also given immigrant visas. So now we have the largest number of Tibetans outside of India. It used to be Nepal now. Now the large, second large number of Tibetans are in America. Uh, so thanks to that 1,000 visas issued by uh, President George H.W. Bush, and we will also provide scholarship at that time, including Fulbright scholarship, right? So I was one of the beneficiaries of the Fulbright scholarship, and uh, now it's called Tibetan Scholarship Program. They change it. Uh, but, and then I got my master's degree from Harvard Law School and then doctorate degree, uh, and then I spent uh, seven years working at Harvard uh, in the People's Republic of Cambridge, you know. I'm still a uh, certified uh, Patriots fan, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> and a baseball fan too, but this time, you know, Nationals won the game, so we'll see this, so I mean, it should be okay. Because otherwise, you know, when you say Patriots and Red Sox, not, not many people um, like it. And uh, the ambassador, a U.S. ambassador to India, uh, John Lester, uh, we tweet, uh, you know, we exchange uh, messages from time to time. Whenever Yankees win, he tweets, he says, how are you? I don't reply. Whenever Red Sox win, I said, how are you? He doesn't reply too. <laughs> so even though I'm a Tibetan and Buddhist, when it comes to Red Sox, Yankees rivalry, my compassion goes out of the way. <laughs> I forget Dalai Lama also, you know. So uh, still, uh, that uh, Red Sox nation, uh, that uh, spirit is still uh, with me. And uh, then Bill Clinton came. Uh, yes, that's true. And then George um, uh, H. Uh, Bush was the first president to meet with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in America. But before him, historically speaking, the first head of uh, uh, nation, head of state to meet His Holiness the Dalai Lama was Vaslav Havel. He had just 
uh, uh, Czechoslovakia had just won uh, its independence, and he became the first president. So he was the first head of state to host his solemnness dialogue. Sometimes, you know, we give all the credits to Americans, but sometimes they say, oh, George, uh, the American president was the first one to host the Solar Dam. It was uh, Václav Havel. But nonetheless, uh, President uh, Bush did a lot. And thereafter, many of the European countries, um, head of states and head of governments also start uh, meeting with the Solonist uh, Lama. And then uh, we know Bill Clinton uh, met his Solonist uh, Lama several times. The drop by, the map room, you know, uh, all that took place. And then famously, uh, in Beijing, when he was having a press conference, Cheng Zemin, uh, President Clinton famously said, well, I have met the Dalai Lama and I like him. If President Cheng Zemin meet him too, you like him too, you know. So that was live, broadcast live in China. So 1.3 at that time billion people heard President of America mentioning his solemnness, Dalai Lama, someone to be likable, you know, which is unprecedented in, and, and also good because for decades, you know, Chinese government has done, all they have done is verify His Holiness Dalai Lama. But to, to have American president say that in the land of China was very important. And after that, uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush uh, came and they really got along. You know, still His Holiness Dalai Lama says, George W. Bush is a good friend. I don't agree with a uh, few things, you know, but he's a good friend. They became pally pally, I mean, really good friends. Even after retirement, George W. Bush painted a portrait of uh, His Solomon's Dalai Lama, you know. And uh, uh, so, uh, and then famously, when the Congressional Gold Medal was awarded uh, to uh, His Solomon's Dalai Lama, George W. Bush came uh, to the Congress and attended the event mm -hmm. uh, to uh, major dislike of the Chinese government. Dimash was issued a lot of complaints of uh, flying around, and President Bush didn't have to, but he went all the way, and uh, you know, and Nancy Pelosi as a speaker was the instrumental uh, in making that uh, Congressional Gold Medal possible uh, for uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama. And then again, you have George W. Bush and Nancy Pelosi side by side, you know, to His Holiness Dalai Lama. That, that reflects the greatness uh, of His Holiness Dalai Lama and bipartisan issue uh, of Tibet uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. And then President Obama met his Solomon's Dalai Lama four times. And in 2014 and 16, this is very important for the first time, on policy, White House issued statements twice, <laughs> applauding and supporting the middle way approach. The White House has made it very clear the genuine autonomy or the middle way approach does not contradict one China policy. So America is for one China policy, but also for middle way approach. So this is the bar that the American government and White House has set. And then now uh, other European countries are following suit and they are talking about and debating about middle way approach in various parliaments and uh, governments. So which uh, was, or was, uh, was made possible by President Obama. And now we are uh, uh, in uh, President Trump's uh, era and uh, I must add, that in the last uh, three years I've been here, the, our funding uh, for Tibetan communities in India and Nepal has increased threefold uh, under this administration. And we passed RATA, or the uh, Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, um, and signed by uh, President Trump. And most importantly, I think the Vice President Mike Pence's speech on China in general, and Tibet in particular, was the strongest uh, ever I think, and Secretary of State Pompeo has also spoken uh, on Tibet issue with uh, his counterpart, and I was told. And just recently, uh, the ambassador at large for international religious freedom, Brownback, uh, was in Dharamsala, you know. CTA, I extended invitation, and he came all the way and gave the strongest speech on religious freedom. Because in early October, we had this special general body meeting of Tibetan community leaders from all over the world, and we passed a unanimous resolution uh, challenging a Chinese government claim that they will decide on the Dalai Lama. What we have said is Dalai Lama represents uh, the uh, myth or the legend of Tibet. You know, uh, it's, it's part of our nationhood and nationality. 
Because as per the myth or the legend, how Tibet as a country and Tibetan people was formed uh, was that, you know, our uh, uh, Tibet is a land of Buddha of compassion, Genesi, and our mother is goddess Tara. So Buddha of compassion and mother is Tara. But then they were manifested uh, in the form of a monkey as a father and the mother in the form of ogress, you know. So they were our father and mother. So I know the movie Shrek doesn't portray, uh, uh, you know, uh, the ogress in a beautiful way, but we would like to believe that our first mother was also very beautiful, even though she was ogress, you know. So that is the evolution of Tibet as a nation and Tibetan race. You know? And then the Dalai Lamas and the Tibetan people are also inseparable. So that's how we believe. And the idea or the concept of reincarnation was invented by us 800 years ago on uh, 4,000 meters high Tibetan plateau. Right? So we have complete ownership over it. We have complete patent over it. I know China is a major factory. They make a lot of duplicates, but as far as reincarnation is concerned, they have no chance because it was manufactured 4,000 meters high on pristine you know, mountains and you know, uh, uh, fresh water. So we have complete copyright over it. And then in that special general body meeting, we made that very clear. Uh, reincarnation was invented by us. And what we are saying is, as far as reincarnation, it's a matter of religious freedom. It's a matter of separation of church and state, where state should not interfere in the matters of church. So based on which the Dalai Lama's reincarnation, for that matter, any reincarnated lamas should be decided by reincarnated lamas and no one else. So that's our argument. Uh, and then uh, the ambassador Brownback came to Dharamsala and he got his speech, I'm quoting him, approved by the State Department and said, we completely agree with the Tibetan version on reincarnation. So the American government is again, this present government is again with us uh, as far as religious freedom uh, is concerned. So we are very uh, grateful to all the former presidents for uh, supporting the Tibet issue and uh, doing their best uh, to uh, support us and keep the issue uh, alive. And, uh, uh, but uh, is a, a major challenge now uh, as, as I said at the beginning, um, the thinking since Nixon, Kissinger time was that we can transform China and China will join the mainstream. Um, and, uh, and then when that, at that time I was at Harvard, so a lot of Chinese students were there. So the theory was that all the Chinese students who are educated in America will return to China and they will play a vital part in transforming or moderating uh, or liberalizing uh, China. Now, in the last many decades, it, it's estimated that 5.2 million uh, Chinese students were educated in the Western world, 5.2 million, of which 3.1 million returned. So 60% have returned, 3.5 million have returned. Now the question is, where are they? Are they the liberal wing? Are they the moderate wing? Are they uh, pro, uh, human rights and freedom for Tibetan people or not, because 3.5 million have returned. 5.2 million were educated in the Western world. So the issue is uh, all this investment that the Western world made in you know, educating the students and doing business with China and having contacts with the Chinese government, how much has paid off? And where are we? So now the topic is preserving freedom in Tibet. So after 3.5 million Chinese students returning to Tibet, we still have to preserve freedom in Tibet. Otherwise, preservation should be automatic. All these people are in leadership position. We say, hey, we went to America, I went to Harvard, Yale, Georgetown. I got educated. I know what human rights is. I know what democracy is. And uh, don't worry, you don't have to, Tibetans, you don't have to fight for your freedom. We will not just not only preserve, but we will protect you and support you and thrive you, you know, which is not the case. Mm -hmm. So in the last 10 years, situation in Tibet has gone from bad to worse. 
As for the Freedom House, um, they come out with Freedom Index every year. And for the, for the last uh, four years, Tibet has been listed as the least free region after Syria. Now, some people might say, oh, what about Hong Kong? What about Xinjiang? But the, I think the metrics and measurement is that the party se secretary of Xinjiang was the party secretary of Tibet autonomous region for the last for five years. So he's the, presently the party secretary of Tibet. In, in, that time, at that, in that time of five years, he, through the grid system, through the surveillance, he has absolute control over the Tibetan plateau. Now, some people say, how does the social credit system work? How does the grid system work? It's very simple. First, you know, I mean, I saw this because over time. First, I, we got the news that very advanced ID cards were issued to Tibetans, 6 million Tibetans, with second generation biometric chips in it. When you have such advanced ID card, it's a sign of progress, it's a sign of development, you know. But no, how it was used, you know, made the difference. So after the IDs were issued, they put so many check posts all over Tibet, highways and you know, towns and cities. Now you have to swipe your ID card. So what it does is then the, the party secretary had developed the software and an algorithm to collect all the data to see which nomadic area, which town, which city, or which farming uh, village has the most travels. More travels you have, then you come under suspect category, then immediately the surveillance cameras will follow, uh, spies and moles will follow, and your village or your town is under surveillance. Now, not just the technological service, they do that. Then, more you travel, you come under, sus you, you come under suspicion. Now, if you travel to India for pilgrimage, let's say, if there's a teaching by His Holiness Dalam, which happened in uh, January of uh, 2017, 10,000 Tibetans from uh, Tibet came to India to seek religious teachings from His Holiness. They went back, almost all of them were called, many were arrested, put in prisons, even in, in, uh, in January of 2018, around 1,000 Tibetans came. They were warned before the teaching started to return to their villages before the teaching starts or will be in trouble. So many people, before the teaching started, there were 1,000 Tibetans initially. 900 plus returned immediately. Open the return, what happened? All their passports were seized. Even those people who were above the age of 70, they had to go to the police station every month. Below the age of 70, prison, sentence, and all that. Passport was seized. Now, you know, you wonder even, you know, 1% of Tibetans in Tibet have passport or not. So there was a blogger who wrote, for Tibetans, they have a better chance of going to heaven than get a passport. You know, it's 1%, you know. So that kind of control. Right. Now with this algorithm software, software, you have collected all the data, you are in that suspect category, and there's a social credit system. You travel to India, for Chinese population in general, if your social credit system is low, they say, oh, you cannot book flight tickets, or you, uh, you cannot book train tickets. If your social credit system is low in Tibet, you go to prison. <laughs> now, the, like the send down uh, approach uh, that the Chinese government had in doing the Cultural Revolution. Now what they do is they send anywhere from 30 to 100 PLA soldiers to villages and make them stay for three months to six months. Now you see those videos and photographs of Xinjiang. All this took place in Tibet. They literally visit your house every day, twice a day, thrice a day, and go through everything. And I got a report of uh, this family member, and obviously when they heard these PLA soldiers are coming to the village and going to stay there for a couple of months, they were worried they cleaned the house of everything, photograph of his holiness, dialam, any material, any even religious material, they cleaned everything. They, they thought the house was clean. But this PLA soldier visits his house, visits their house every day. And one morning, this PLA soldier was playing with the altar, you know, where we have statues of Buddha and all, and 
And he was, you know, he was fiddling through, and then he found a receipt, a small piece of paper, which was folded. He opened it, <laughs> and it was a receipt that the family had sent some money for the late father's death to India. And they got the receipt from a monastery associated with Solonis Dalai Lama. That's it. The whole family was in trouble. So that much, you know, that kind of a grid system is imposed. There's a physical, technological. So this is how the social security system works in Tibet. Now, once you impose that kind of system in Tibet, and obviously freedom is at minimal. That's why the Freedom House is saying Tibet is the least free region in the whole world after Syria for four years in a row. Recently, there was a Washington Post journalist. He, what do you call it, a Facebook live from Hassa, from Potala Palace. And he said, I'm quoting him. He said, look, for journalists in Beijing, it's more difficult to get access to Tibet than North Korea. But he, he said, I'll be the first one to, you know, Facebook live from Apotala Palace. And he was quite objective. He said, look, uh, this is a controlled, you know, a trip. And we have 17 journalists from Beijing. And yes, we have listened to the propaganda of the Chinese government. Uh, we know that. And the, 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 uh, the handler from the Chinese foreign ministry, he, 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 he's, he's on that video. He said, hey, don't say propaganda, okay? Just say publicity, you know? <laughs> So, I mean, he's there to say that, hey, for publicity purposes, we are bringing you here, so give us good coverage. And if you go through the 17 journalists, again, one idea or the story that they want to put is about the reincarnation of Dalai Lama. Amb uh, the Chinese ambassador in India wrote a long piece in an Indian newspaper whereby they're justifying this is how the next Dalai Lama will be chosen by the Chinese government. They have all the historical, conventional, traditional right and ownership over selecting the next Dalai Lama. And just this July, nine journalists from India were taken for a pay trip. I met one of them to Tibet. And after seven days, they came. All nine of them had exactly the same headlines. We will choose the next Dalai Lama. India should not interfere. If you do, you'll pay a price. Mm. India is a huge country. And already the Chinese government is threatening India. Now you can imagine what the Chinese government will do to the rest of the world, which are much more smaller than India. So clearly, uh, freedom is under attack. And uh, uh, we are being you know, uh, challenged and pushed. Having said that, I don't want to, you know, uh, go on with this gloom and doom kind of uh, uh, narrative. But if you look at Hong Kong and Xinjiang and Tibet, the silver lining is that it's clearly now the whole world is waking up and saying, well, Tibet is not an exception. We just thought it's only with the Tibetans the Chinese government was repressive. Now they say, OK, it's Hong Kong too. Uh, they call themselves Hong Kongers, but they are Chinese. And, uh, you know, Uyghurs too, and Taiwan too, and Mongolian too. So it's more, not an exception, more rule. That's the approach. And from South China Sea, with all the neighboring countries, even Nepal is waking up and saying, oh, uh, our land or the borderland is being, you know, um, encroached by the uh, Chinese government. There is a member of parliament from Arunachal Pradesh in India. Uh, who spoke uh, in the Indian parliament just two days ago, and he said, you know, almost 50 kilometers of land of India is being encroached in Arunachal Pradesh alone. Mm -hmm. Now, all the neighboring countries are also waking up. Hence, this is, in a way, a challenge and an opportunity to say we have to protect freedom of the Tibetan people and freedom in China and freedom of the whole world. So that's a challenge and an opportunity. And hopefully, we all will, you know, get our act together and be strong and, you know, uh, nonviolently uh, fight on. And I'm absolutely certain, ultimately, truth will prevail and freedom will prevail. Thank you.
Dr. Sangha has offered to take a couple questions if there are questions in the audience. Um, right here. We'll, we'll, we'll get you a microphone. You can identify yourself. My name is Burton Wides. I'm pro bono counsel for Initiatives for China, a group representing, advocating for everybody oppressed by Beijing. Um, in addition to the very depressing picture you placed about what's going on in Tibet per se, uh, my information I received was that it's as bad uh, in many, in some ways in uh, Sichuan province where there are enough Tibetans to qualify under the constitution as an autonomous uh, region within China. I think there's one <coughs> famous temple that uh, has had more immolations than any temple in Tibet per se. Uh, is there anything that is being done to publicize that as well? Uh, yes, I think you are referring to uh, Naba area of Amdo um, and uh, mainly uh, Kirti Monastery and affiliate uh, monasteries had uh, and continues to have the largest number of self immolations. Um, so far, 153 Tibetans have burned themselves. And uh, almost you know, 30% are from the monastic community. Um, and then, CTA Tibetan administration, we consistently and categorically discourage self immolation and we have made repeated appeals. If there is decrease in self immolation which is the case nowadays, uh, we believe it's mainly because of our appeals. But how did uh, self immolation you know, happen is the issue. Um, primarily because even in Xinjiang, you will see this, is you can't have even a peaceful protest in Tibet. If a group of two or three try, you'll be arrested, you'll be imprisoned, and you'll be tortured few months, few years, right? Even if you're released, you'll be as, you know, bad as dead and sick. Now, there's another approach that they use. Once you're sentenced, you are sent to a prison four or five hundred miles away. This is brutal. What it does is, now let's say the father, mostly, sometimes mother, participated in a protest. He or she is sent to a prison, you know, four or five hundred miles away. Now, the mother has to take clothes and food for the father and travel four or five hundred kilometers, miles. And then you're not given access easily. You have to wait for days or weeks. You have to spend all the money you have, right? And in the process, you neglect your children. You have to go to school. You have to take care of them. They're neglected. And you make a couple of trips. If that your father or mother is in prison for five or ten years, you bankrupt the whole house. Your children don't get education. They don't get care. They don't get you know uh, attention, and, and the whole life is ruined. And as it is, even they're educated, they are not going to get jobs because they are blacklisted now. So the protesters in Tibet realize that if you participate in protest and go to prison for five, 10 years and suffer yourself through torture, and in the process bankrupt your family and ruin whole family's life, then it's better for them to put gas over your body and burn yourself and die quickly than make whole family suffer. So self-immolation happened in Tibet and continues to happen because of the repressive system in Tibet. Self-immolation, mm -hmm. but I was really wondering whether, in the view of your government, is it helpful or, or not so helpful to also publicize what's going on to the Tibetans in China, per se? Yes. Um, I mean, to use the word helpful, you know, it's, it's yeah, uh, it's a little oh, complicated. Yeah. That's true. But our job, that's why I said, as a human being, we want every Tibetan to leave, so don't participate in self immolation But as a Buddhist, when someone dies, you pray for them. 
But as a Tibetan, you have to magnify the suffering or the reason why self immolation takes place. So we do. We do highlight why individual person have participated and self immolated and died. So we do that. So, but it's a you know, difficult moral ethical question. How much to publicize, how much not to publicize. But we do share uh, self immolation uh, cases uh, with the world. Um, but then, you know, it's not that easy uh, to get publicity uh, given the fact with all these things happening in Syria, you know, uh, Afghanistan, all that. Uh, but we do that, yes. Can I ask you a quick question? And we'll take one more from the audience. Um, what kind of reception are you getting around town as you make your calls? Um, I, I know it's positive, mm -hmm. but uh, do you see any difference from the way it was a couple of years ago as these sort of concerns around China has cri have crystallized, the, the kind of concerns you raised in your, in your remarks? Around the world. Um, I've been in my position now. I'm entering ninth year. So first five or six years, very difficult. Even self immolation didn't get much coverage because even news media, you know, uh, it's, you know, with a lot of uh, um, business people have shares in the media and they have business interests in China. And thereby, uh, really, I mean, they, you know, um, self-censor. Uh, because I know a case in Milan, I'm, I mentioned it now. So there was a one pro-Tibet person who had share in that newspaper. And he makes sure that whenever there's an article on Tibet, he makes sure that he gets the preferred journalist who writes the article and puts it online after the hard copy is printed. Because if you put online in the evening, the other, you know, shareholders will intervene and kill the story. It never makes it to the hard copy. I mean, that kind of, uh, you know, kind of a guerrilla fight you have to do just to publish one article. Uh, so, so for, the, for five, six years, very difficult. Now it's changing. You know, European Union as a whole issued a report saying they see China as a systemic competition. Even the German Business Association just recently published a report saying, you know, China is a systemic competition to German business. Ten years ago, they said China is an opportunity, mm -hmm. you know. So it's changing. Even in uh, uh, Australia, you go country by country, the discourse is changing. They're more mm -hmm. skeptical. You know, they are, uh, they, um, uh, so they are willing uh, to provide platforms. Uh, in Czech Republic, we have established the largest parliamentary group in Europe, 51 members of parliamentarians, you know. And I was there, I think, three weeks ago. I got a formal reception by the uh, Czech Senate of the uh, six uh, uh, vice president, four uh, came, and there was an hour-long, you know, kind of a formal reception. Um, so Japan has the largest parliamentary support group in the whole world, 92 members of parliament, you know. So even 15 years ago, the J Japanese government will not mention Tibet. Mm -hmm. Now they have the largest parliamentary support group. So it's changing. Uh, German Bundestag had a hearing. Uh, this May on Tibet, um, and then the speaker of famous speaker of the uh, House of Commons in uh, England, you know, officially welcomed me uh, in the chamber and participated in a Tibet e event. That evening, it spent one whole hour, you know. So, so it's really changing uh, that way. So this is something, you know, uh, good to see. But still, Europe is still seventeen plus one. Mm -hmm. Italy has just joined one of the major you know, G7 countries, right, mm -hmm. to sign uh, up on uh, One Bell, One Road initiative. Mm -hmm. you know, Switzerland signed a uh, free trade agreement and uh, even Belt and Road initiative. So there are some trends which are regressive, but some trends which are progressive. Yeah, it's interesting. The um, Chinese sometimes are their own worst enemies when it comes uh, pressing their cause. You know, I remember doing events like this on Hong Kong four mm. or five years ago, and we might have uh, 12 people in the audience. Mm. You know, no one cared. I mean, we mm. had Joshua Wong here back then and Martin Lee and all of these guys. And and now, look, they just passed these bills unanimously, uh, virtually in, 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 in Congress, largely because of the reaction from the Chinese. Yes. They, they should be much smarter in the way they they play these things. Mm. Tibet, Tibetan authorities have offered for years responsible um, uh, measured approaches to the problems that they face and they, and they address, and the Chinese reject them yes. and only build on the, the backlash against them. It's mm -hmm. pretty extraordinary. I want to take one more question, then we want to get to our experts. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. We uh, encourage you to become more and more of a Washington Nationals fan. Um, in, um, in, now you have won the World Series. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the, that's the reason. Um, in 1968, uh, America across the country experienced protests, and there was a commission called the Kerner Commission that said this country was two societies, black and white, separate and unequal. Fifty years later, uh, when we look back, we see that child poverty, deep poverty, income inequality, uh, wealth inequality have all increased and uh, mass incarceration has increased tenfold and really is the present iteration of slavery and Jim Crow. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians know this. So as we criticize them for human rights, they often say, well, you have no credibility, America. You need to take care of your own uh, internal situation, which leads some of us to believe excuse me, some of us to believe that if we were to really significantly reduce poverty and inequality and racial injustice in the country, it would be good domestically, but it also would increase our soft power and could therefore help in Tibet, help in uh, uh, East Turkestan, help in Hong Kong and all the, all the other places that are oppressed by China. Would you agree with that policy framework? I know you are talking from your report, you know, your institute report, and I'm not an expert on your report. But, you know, uh, sometimes, sometimes, you know, when you raise this issue, uh, you know, Chinese are very good uh, and uh, in exploiting uh, not just Americans' emotion, you know, uh, other countries' uh, 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 historical, you know, uh, exploitation, so to speak, and then uh, twist it and use it against you. And then suddenly the other side feels very guilty. You know, it's, oh, maybe I should not be talking about Tibet because as it is, my situation uh, at home is uh, equally bad. But the world is equally, it's never equally bad. In America, I'm sure there are racial issues. I don't deny that. But then African-American just became a president of you know, America, right? Now, do you think the Chinese government will ever, ever allow a Tibetan or a Mongolian or Uyghur to be a president of China? Forget a president, prime minister, or even the standing committee members? Impossible, you know? So, uh, even in Tibet autonomous region, in the last 60 years, party secretary has never been a Tibetan. Now then, the Standing Committee of Tibet Autonomous Region has 13 members. And if you look at the 13 members, obviously majority, seven are Han Chinese. So they have majority. Now remaining six are half Chinese, married to a Chinese, or daughter-in-law or son-in-law is Chinese, you see. And there's one pure Tibetan. So this, is, this is the system that this is all, we're talking about the political system, right? Political leadership. If you look at the military, absolutely Han Chinese control. Police, absolutely. Intelligence, absolutely. Even in religious matters, you have Han Chinese guys sitting there. So when you compare the American system, you know, despite all the inequalities, pales in comparison to the system we are talking about uh, in, in, in China. You know? <coughs> so I think Americans should be very bold, very confident in saying, if you can provide what we are providing to minorities in America, I think Tibetans and Uyghurs will not complain so much as they're doing now, right? So I think, um, I know there are a lot of reports, but one should never feel you know, any guilt in speaking about uh, Tibetans. Because they go to uh, Canada and say the same thing. Oh, how did you treat uh, the aborigines and things mm -hmm. like that, you know? And the First Nation people, um, very, very different. It's a very good note to end on. Thank you very much. Thank you so Please much. Please join me in thanking Dr. Sange. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope to see you soon. So good luck. Thanks. I'm going to invite Matteo and Olivia up to the stage. Well, we've constrained our time a little bit with Matteo and, and Olivia, but I'm sure you'll agree it was for a good cause. Uh, it was a very 
very enlightening, interesting, uh, lightning um, comments from Sangai. The, um, the comments there at the end I found particularly useful because as Americans, I think we're all uh, critical, self-critical. You know, we are examining each other uh, and ourselves constantly, and uh, that's actually a great strength. But sometimes it can lead us to false equivalencies and, and, um, and accepting some criticisms that whereby they might be uh, valid on their face, you know, when they're compared with other situations around the world or not valid at all. Um, so I wanted to uh, have uh, a couple other people speak to us, and maybe examine some of the things that uh, Dr. Sangai uh, began in his, his remarks. So first we're gonna turn to a very good friend of Heritage Foundation, Matteo Macacci. Uh, Matteo joined the International Campaign for Tibet as president in December of 2013. He was also a member of the Italian Parliament from 2008 to 2013 in the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly and in the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee there. And then we'll turn to Olivia, Olivia Anus, who you may know is a senior policy analyst here in our Asian Studies Center. She focuses on human rights and on some select security issues and, and very crucially on the intersection of those issues in, in many instances. Olivia has been with Heritage for, for 2013, seven, seven, years, seven, seven years, okay, seven years. Um, so she's a, she's a veteran already of Heritage despite her youthful appearance. <laughs> so let me start out with Matteo and then we'll, yeah. we'll turn to Olivia. Thank you, Walter. It's always good to be uh, here at Heritage with you and uh, Olivia. Um, Heritage has also been uh, uh, working on China and also in Tibet for, for many years. So. We thank you for your focus and your research also uh, specifically on Tibet. I was asked to speak briefly about U.S. policy on Tibet and some of the latest development. Um, Lobsan Sangai gave uh, a quite an extensive, extensive historical you know, readout of you know, U.S. Uh, policy on Tibet uh, in the context of U.S. policy uh, on China. Uh, I think one key point where to start from, which I think is important uh, to remember, is that uh, uh, especially in the 90s, there was a huge uh, concern you know, from the United States after the fall of the Berlin Wall um, uh, in trying to promote democracy, to promote human rights also vis-a-vis -vis China. And one key discussion at the time was whether to continue to link progress in trade relations with China to human rights and rule of law or not to do that. Uh, there was a you know, big fight between the Congress and actually the Clinton administration in the mid-90s whether to delink trade and human rights when it comes to China. And in the end, as it was mentioned before, uh, the White House you know, uh, won. And it was decided to delink uh, uh, trade and human rights. And China was uh, allowed to join the WTO and the narrative that China would progress as economic, you know, uh, developments go on in the country will bring also more freedom, the rule of law, and all of that. That's the you know the discussion that everybody now also uh, continues to 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 refer to uh, when it comes to you know China policy, U.S. China policy today. And the reason for that is that we have seen, um, I think, especially uh, frankly, since the Trump administration took over, um, a rethinking of U.S. Um, policy on China, which basically started not from the point of view of human rights, rule of law, and religious freedom, you know, to be fair to everybody, but mainly for geopolitical reasons, you know, economic issues, and also military uh, concern. Actually, uh, analysts in the military and uh, high officials in the military for many years have, you know, raised alarms about, you know, China's uh, ambitions and policies in the South China Sea and in other um, areas in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. So this has been a shift that has been happening. And I think uh, uh, there is uh, an opportunity. We have seen uh, Congress actually in these days, uh, as you mentioned, Walter, with the passage of the Hong Kong uh, Democracy and Human Rights Act um, with uh, the discussion about the Uyghur bill related to human rights, the discussion around the new uh, bill on uh, US policy on Tibet, which is ongoing. There is an opportunity, we think, uh, to bring back uh, the discussion around human rights and rule of law at the center of American uh, foreign policy. And this is something that I think uh, uh, will benefit uh, US policy in general, because abdicating those values in the 90s 
has really, you know, certainly not proven to bring China uh, to a more moderate position. I think they have taken uh, that as an opportunity to expand their power, uh, to expand their influence, and at the same time, consolidating a political system uh, which is more centralized, less, uh, with less opportunities for people to express themselves, whether they are minorities or Chinese. Let's not forget that the repression uh, continues to hit also, for example, anybody in China who tries to defend you know, human rights. Uh, Chinese lawyers who have been, over the years, trying to find some space um, you know, from prote protecting social workers, from uh, environmental issues, they have been, you know, jailed and, and repressed as well. Uh, what for us has been interesting, uh, the international campaign for Tibet, we have been advocating uh, for uh, some time for a change, for a, for a shift in U.S. policy on Tibet. And we started actually five years ago, uh, almost six now, with, uh, with the bill that was introduced uh, by Congressman McGovern, it was called uh, uh, the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. And basically the idea was try to insert in the context of US-China relations, to go back to a principle which is the basis of international law, the, the principle of reciprocity, uh, diplomatic reciprocity uh, between countries, when it comes to freedom of movement, specifically uh, when it comes to Tibet. And uh, the reason for that is because if you get a Chinese visa, you're not allowed automatically to go to Tibet. You need a special permit. And this is a policy that the Chinese government has implemented for decades to isolate Tibet from the world. And isolating Tibet from the world means that information doesn't get out, information does, go, does not go in. And this is one of the reasons also why Freedom House ranks Tibet so low in the, in, the, in the index of freedom because basically there's no opportunity really for, for people to exercise any civil liberties, even if you don't have a humanitarian crisis you know, compared to other situations. But going back to reciprocity, uh, by doing that, uh, you, pro you project the, 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 the question of, you know, um, of Tibet and U.S. policy on Tibet as an American interest. As something that, you know, as there are Americans, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people who are, uh, you know, familiar with the Dalai Lama, respect his teachings, uh, they're, you know, Buddhist practitioners, uh, people who want to go and see Tibet. You know, there is an interest to, to, to have access to the culture. Uh, you know, China has been restricting that. While at the same time, the United States and many other governments have opened up our countries to Chinese interests of any kind, journalists, NGOs, diplomats, Politicians can come and do whatever they want. So, uh, so this bill was introduced. Uh, didn't have much traction for the last couple of years, for the first uh, two three years. But then, when the Trump administration came, you know, to power, uh, you have heard, you know, even the president many times talking about reciprocity in the context of economic relations and the trade war that you know, Walter ma makes Walter a little bit nervous sometimes <laughs> for the effect it can have. Uh, but our approach has been okay. I mean, reciprocity, it's a fair principle. It's a principle that everybody accepts. It's not, it doesn't even go near to the question of interference in internal affairs. Because is, you treat me like this, and I treat you as a nation in the same way, and I treat you, your citizens, or your business in the same way. So the idea for us has been to try to expand this notion of reciprocity from economic issues to freedom of movement. But let's talk about you know, freedom of the media, or freedom of information. How is it possible that Chinese media are allowed to set up shop in Washington, in Berlin, in London, and expand their you know, English language or Italian, French language operations? And there's no one, there's not even one foreign media allowed to broadcast in China, in Chinese, you know, mm -hmm. and reach that market, not only you know, freedom of information for that people. So um, I think this is an opportunity for, uh, you know, for countries to look at China from their own point of view not just from the point of view of the repression that is happening in Hong Kong, in, in Tibet, or in Xinjiang, but actually to see that when you have such repression happening in, in, inside the country, apart from the moral you know, clarity issue that you need to raise, there is an interest on your side to try to rebalance the relationship with authoritarian mm -hmm. governments. Because if you continue to uh, go on in that way, it's an imbalanced relationship that cannot last. Because how is it possible that you, you, know, you have a now the second economy, biggest economy in the world, that will deny access to their market to everybody else in key sectors like you know, freedom you know, of movement, freedom of information, or other areas. And the State Department, to their credit, recently they issued new regulations uh, 
requesting not full reciprocity with China, but requesting Chinese diplomats in the United States to report to the State Department who they are going to meet when it comes to educational institutions, politicians, or others. Actually, for US diplomats in China, they need to get permission to go to university to go to meet with politicians. So now here they're asking them to at least inform uh, the State Department. And I think that's a, a sound approach. It's not something that you know wants to escalate the relationship, but I think it's important to uh, to draw a line at some point and uh, and tell that you know these uh, double standards are not are not uh, uh, possible. I'm going to uh, close uh, soon. There is another uh, I think geopolitical uh, U.S. interest when it comes to Tibet that is often not uh, you know paid much attention to. The question of water and water security in Asia. The Tibetan Plateau is the uh, largest repository of fresh water uh, outside of the North and the South Pole. Um, for the effects of climate change or you know whatever you know uh, is happening, uh, many people say that the next wars may be about water, not about oil in the future. And now China has been uh, refusing to access to any of the international conventions um, regulating you know, transnational rivers. Uh, has built dozens of dams on the Mekong, on the Brahmaputra, other rivers that affect overall around one billion people in, in Asia. And now the administration has come out with the Indo-Pacific strategy, which includes actually an approach that we include in not only the South China Sea, but also the Indian regions. And so the, the protection and making sure that you know, there is full access to uh, the Tibetan Plateau and to its resources, not just for China, but actually for the entire region, is a strategic issue that should be um, uh, put on the table uh, in the context of uh, you know, US, uh, you know, China relations and its uh, Indo-Pacific um, policy. Lastly, um, was mentioned before, uh, Congress is now, after the approval of the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, is now pushing for a new legislation. Uh, it's an update of the Tibetan Policy Act that you mentioned. It focuses on the question of religious freedom and the uh, succession to His Holiness Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. But not only that, it talks about uh, applying reciprocity, for example, on the uh, opening of new consulates uh, in the US in, in China. Uh, now it is, it is going to be approved. It will be mandatory if China wants to open a new uh, US, uh, Chinese consulate in the US to allow the opening of a US uh, consulate in Lhasa. Um, there are norms to strengthen the office of the special coordinator um, and when it comes to uh, you know, State Department policy. Uh, there are norms r related to water security and uh, environmental protection. So um, I think what we see. Uh, going back to my previous point, is that I think, especially in the US Congress, we have seen a number and a growing number. You were asking before if things have changed over the last two years. Uh, I can tell you on Tibet, there's always been a unanimous consent. But the variety now of members who are joining uh, because of also you know, their constituents' interest uh, in, in, in the relationship with China is certainly growing. And what you have seen yesterday with, uh, you know, this morning actually there was a press conference with, uh, you know, while the impeachment hearings are going on, you had a press conference with uh, Nancy Pelosi, McCall, Chris Smith, McGovern, a very strong bipartisan coalition that doesn't shy away, you know, to, you know, to move forward on this issue despite the division which is in Washington. So I think this should be worrying for the Chinese government. Uh, because they haven't been responding in a positive way to any of these actions. You know, the bills that have been passed, they continue to have a very hard line position. But this, is, I think, is a, is a, is a big shift, which is, uh, I don't think is going to change even with the you know, future change of administration in its you know, fundamental terms. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's a good point that um, so foreign policy and Asia policy continue, even if CNN is only covering the impeachment hearings, all of these things are continuing and, uh, and, and we do have ways to make policy in absence of maybe the 100% uh, attention of the chief executive, you know. So uh, that's a really important point, I think maybe lost on some, like the Chinese embassy, in fact. Uh, but let me turn it to Olivia. Great. 
So in 2017, the Trump administration inaugurated the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Strategy. And when people think about the Indo-Pacific Strategy, they often think about security aspects or economic aspects, as Matteo alluded to, but they don't typically think of the values components of the Indo-Pacific Strategy. But to overlook the values components of the Indo-Pacific strategy is to overlook the two primary modifiers that are affixed to it, which is free and open, both of which relate directly to values. And when the administration describes what free and open mean, they talk about it from a values perspective, even using language like human rights, the promotion of religious freedom. Um, and you see this, I think, most explicitly stated in, when the vice president uh, released an op-ed in the Washington Post um, where he says, this is a direct quote from him, the Indo-Pacific strategy supports transparent and responsive government, the rule of law, and the protection of individual rights, including religious freedom. Nations that empower their citizens, nurture civil society, fight corruption, and guard their sovereignty are stronger homes for their people and better partners for the United States. Conversely, nations that oppress their people often violate their neighbor's sovereignty as well. Authoritarianism and aggression have no place in the Indo-Pacific region. That's an unequivocal commitment right there to promote values, to preserve freedom. And that's exactly what we're here to talk about today. And I think, you know, when people think of the Indo-Pacific strategy, they also think about it in juxtaposition to China. And I think this is why it's so important that values actually are at play. And I, I want to um, outline three reasons why I think it's important for the U.S. to promote human rights in Asia, but especially in China and in particular in the situation into Tibet. I want to outline very briefly the challenges that are faced. I think both Dr. Sange and Matteo did that really well, but just wanted to cover it very briefly. And then I'll highlight a couple of solutions very quickly. Um, so the first reason why I think promoting human rights in Asia is critical is because promoting values um, actually promotes U.S. interests. It's often talked about almost as if interests and values are in two separate buckets. But the reality is that when we promote values um, abroad, we actually are promoting U.S. interests. And the reason why I think this is especially the case in Asia is, secondly, because there's a battle over values being waged in Asia today. There's a battle between two different systems of governance, authoritarianism, which is being promoted by China, and democracy, which is promoted by the U.S. And I think whoever is sort of the winner of that battle is ultimately going to shape the rules of the road. And whoever sets those rules of the road runs the road. And so that means over the long term that if there's erosion of liberty in Asia, primarily perpetrated by China, um, that you're going to have that impacting not only the 1.4 billion people who live in China, but the billions of, of others who live in Asia in general. Um, I think that China expects um, that there will not be a response to the severe human rights violations that are going on. I think they almost anticipate that there will be silence when it comes to what's going on in Xinjiang or what's going on in Tibet or the religious repression that's going on. But I think it's time for us to prove them wrong. Um, the third reason why I think it's important to promote human rights in Asia is because China doesn't put human rights issues in a separate bucket from the national security challenges, and the U.S. shouldn't either. When China thinks about Xinjiang, when they think about Tibet or Hong Kong or even religious freedom, they think about it as core and central to their national interests because they view stability in their own sovereignty as, as their primary interest, and they view all of those issues as potentially threatening. So when the U.S. government responds by putting human rights issues in a separate bucket in a smaller component of um, its overarching policy, I think that we fail to acknowledge how the Chinese view human rights and values issues themselves. So this is definitely worth thinking about. The specific challenges that are faced in the Tibet context are really significant. Dr. Sange, of course, referenced the surveillance state there. And um, when he talks about the surveillance state that exists in, in Tibet, it was all pioneered, all of the surveillance state challenges that you see not only in China, but also that China is exporting elsewhere, all started in Tibet. And it's with this grid-style social management system um, that essentially puts 
uh, police stations. They're called convenience police stations um, on every street corner. And they use that language of convenience just like it, to sort of jog our memories on a convenience store, like as common as a Walgreens or a CVS. Convenient for who? The police yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And and these are for the purpose of surveilling everyday actions. Um, I mean, in the Xinjiang context, it's even to monitor, you know, are people going to uh, temple? What types of activities are they doing? Human Rights Watch has put out fantastic reports in the Xinjiang context in particular that demonstrates that even somebody exiting out their back door instead of their front is viewed with suspicion. Uh, this is the level of surveillance that we're dealing with. And all of this was pioneered in the Tibet context. So we must watch Tibet because this is where sort of it's the cutting edge of where China starts its repression. The second challenge that I see is that, um, you know, it's often referenced that what's taking place in Xinjiang looks a lot like cultural genocide. Well, there, I think, are the fingerprints of cultural genocide taking place in Tibet today. And the reason why I would say this is because, um, for example, the Chinese government refuses um, for Tibetans to be able to use their own language. This is a classic um, way in which governments repress individuals and, and engage in forms of cultural genocide. Sinicization of all religion or the attempt to make religion conform with the Chinese Communist Party is another way that not only Tibetans, but Christians, Catholics, um, Uyghur Muslims, Hui Muslims, um, and the Falun Gong are all being persecuted in this way, and, and we should be concerned. Of course, as Mateo outlined, the failure to permit access is, of course, a challenge as well, whether that's access to journalists or outside aid workers um, or even U.S. government officials. Um, and then, of course, also the detention of those advocating for freedom and human rights, including, I think, most recently, even this week, there were some monks who have been detained uh, for monks, according to Radio Free Asia reporting. Um, the final challenge, I think, is one not necessarily limited to Tibet, but actually the U.S. government. I think Dr. Sange did outline a number of things that um, the executive branch has done, and Matteo covered some of what um, Congress has been doing to advocate for Tibet, but still the action has been limited in the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis previous president's attention um, toward the Tibetan region. So while I do commend Ambassador Brownback's recent travels um, and meetings with the Dalai Lama, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done, and that's why I want to turn to some of the solutions. Um, when you came in, you may have gotten a paper that goes into much greater detail on the particular recommendations that I have. I'll just briefly outline a few. Um, the first is that the U.S. government needs to move quickly to fill the position of special coordinator for Tibetan issues. Um, there has been nobody in that position for far too long. It's an easy position to fill. It's congressionally mandated, and it should have been done a long time ago. Um, going ahead and filling that is one way that the administration can demonstrate its commitment to promoting values in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, the second is that previous presidents, um, in fact, every president since George W. Bush met with the Dalai Lama, <laughs> but of course, President Trump has not yet yet met with the Dalai Lama. This is a very yet another great action item that this administration could easily undertake. Um, the third is that the U.S. government should consider sanctioning Chen Guangguo and other senior Chinese officials who are responsible for repression in Tibet. I want to dwell on this recommendation just a little bit longer because I think Chen Guangguo was the one who architected that surveillance state and the social grid style social management system that has been referenced, I think, by all of us. Um, and he has been recommended for sanctioning specifically for the role that he plays in Xinjiang. But I think that just based off of how Treasury works, they need evidence um, that they can gather from a legal standpoint, and that often requires separation between the time that an event has taken place or repression has taken place and their ability to sanction. So they may not be able to collect the evidence on Chen Guangguo for what's going on in Xinjiang on the daily right now, but they have the historical evidence from what went on in Tibet. And so it may be that you're more easily able to target Chen Guangguo and other senior Chinese officials who are involved in repression in Tibet to stem the tide on future um, forms of repression that are ongoing. There are other recommendations that I'd be happy to outline or talk about in Q&A, but I think I'll, I'll leave it there. So, Great, thank you, Olivia. Um, I want to take maybe 10 extra minutes. I never do that, but, uh, but since we got behind, I think it's only fair, and I, want to, I, I do want to explore this a little bit with you. Uh, I want to open it up to questions also, um, so please give it some thought uh, as I ask this first question of Matteo. Um, 
The, um, could, could you sort of um, clarify for us or, or put it very succinctly what the goal is of the Tibetan authorities, the Dalai Lama, and to the extent that international campaign for Tibet shares that. What yeah. is the goal, especially as it relates to big order issues like sovereignty? I yeah. mean, what is it that, that all of these things are leading to that you are pursuing? Yeah, and then I have just one small note I have to remember about the implementation of one okay. of the bills. Uh, but I mean, the, the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan authorities have been very consistent from actually from the 70s. Uh, they gave up the uh, idea of independence from China, and they formulated the idea of uh, you know having genuine autonomy, as was mentioned by by Lobsang Sangai. Uh, this has been you know consistent. It was presented in the late 80s in the European Parliament in Strasbourg. It was presented here uh, with Tom Lantos actually at the Human Rights Caucus uh, at the time, and uh, has been part of the diplomatic you know, uh, effort. Uh, there have been fact-finding missions of you know, Tibetan representatives who have been allowed in the 80s, in the 70s and the 80s, to go to China and Tibet and meet with the people there. So, I mean, there's always been a channel somehow between the Dalai Lama and the Chinese, and an acknowledgment also by the Chinese government of the importance that the Dalai Lama has in trying to solve this issue. Um, this issue comes down to you know, what is now, frankly, it's, you know, sometimes people say it's a Tibetan issue, crisis. This is occupation. So this was a country that was invaded, and there hasn't been a political solution. So the goal is to find a political solution through negotiations, which would lead to genuine autonomy. Uh, so the Tibetan side has presented a memorandum in 2010, which details what are the you know, proposals uh, for autonomy, which are actually within the context of the existing Chinese constitution. Uh, so some people say it's very mild, you know, because within the Chinese constitution actually don't have, you know, many liberties and freedoms, but at least the autonomy uh, and regional laws would allow for, you know, question related to culture, religion, education, for the Tibetans to run their own affairs. Mm -hmm. So that is the proposal that is being put forward. And frankly, the Dalai Lama has the legitimacy to have the Tibetan people accept this proposal. And without the Dalai Lama, and we know that he's now already 84 years old, there's probably no Tibetan who could, you know, bring, you know, the Tibetan people to accept, you know, this very mild uh, proposal. So that is the goal, and so the international efforts and, and advocacy uh, are geared geared towards that. But on the actually, I forgot to mention that the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, you know, uh, tries to promote more access to Tibet for US diplomats, journalists, NGOs, politicians. And the mechanism through this has to work is uh, twofold. So the State Department issued a report last April uh, assessing the level of access granted to Americans. And the, you know, the picture that came out was very bleak. Basically, the line, the main line was the Chinese government systematically impedes access to Tibet for US citizens. Based on this assessment, now by the end of the year, State Department has to come up with a list and transmit to Congress, maybe it won't be public, of uh, Chinese and Tibetan officials who are responsible for making this restriction policy possible and the policy behind this to be denied US visas. So this is something that you know, the administration is supposed to, to implement. Uh, and naturally, you know, is not uh, you know, tit for tat, is not blocking access to American you know, for a million you know, Chinese is only for Chinese officials who are responsible of these uh, policies. But I think it would be an important signal that will show how serious also the administration is when it comes to the implementation of legislation uh, adopted by Congress. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, clarification. You know, um, the reason why I ask about the, uh, the ultimate goal um, of Tibet is because the atmosphere here especially is so charged over anything to do with China. And um, I'm afraid in some ways it validates the Chinese narrative about the aims of US policy. And if it validates the aims of US policy, that it's confrontation or it's uh, containment of China or it's pushing for independence for Tibet and mm -hmm. for Taiwan and for Hong Kong, uh, it, it, I think it ultimately hurts 
to Met's cause. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, at this point, you know, three years ago, I was a China hawk. You know, today the hawks moved to, I, I don't, they moved way over there. I, can't, I, can't, I, don't, I don't recognize them anymore. But, but because this is, yeah. this is kind of the, the problem. So who knows? Let, let's see how it goes. They want to go this far in that direction and see how it goes. But uh, I just have this feeling it's not going yeah. to go well for, for many of our causes because of that. But if I can add, um, there is a more philosophical fundamental point. Um, the Dalai Lama believes in coexistence among people. Mm -hmm. You know, he believes that we are all equal as human beings, you know, that ethnic divisions are not, you know, something that should, you know, create, uh, you know, political conflict uh, among others. So he's, you know, he's naturally, the, it's a political proposal, but it's a genuine, you know, phys philosophical approach to coexistence. Mm -hmm. And he has shown, I think, uh, uh, as few other, you know, spiritual leaders in the world that he is practicing what, he, what he's preaching. And so even you may, you know, if I ask you, when is the last time you heard the Dalai Lama uh, saying bad words about China, to the Chinese government? I mean, he's so, you know, moderate and trying really to find a space to allow, you know, the Chinese people who appreciate also, you know, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which are many, and appreciate, you know, going to Tibet and, you know, uh, its environment, etc., to find a, a way forward. So I think for the Chinese, Tibet is probably the easiest mm -hmm. of the issues they have that they could solve. Uh, and unfortunately, I think, you know, naturally there is this side which you say as hardened, but within China, you know, with Xi Jinping, unfortunately, the direction has been to really, you know, concentrate power, you know, abolish third limits you know, restrict uh, and, and all of that. So that, you know, it's difficult. But I think, you know, there is still a, a chance if the Chinese government decides that, you know, this uh, stonewalling approach has to mm -hmm. end. I think Tibet would be a place where they could start mm -hmm. uh, to, to really engage with the, with the Tibetans. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, let me, let me get here. We have another one right there. The, the U.S. government or the U.S. Congress uh, via the Tibetan Policy Act recognizes Tibet as an occupied territory. Um, no. If you read the, uh, if, you, if, you, if you read... Uh, there is a uh, finding that refers to a previous position, but not the, well, uh, the Tibetan Policy Act. It, it reaffirms it if I read it correctly, but... Um, yeah, it's a finding that refers to an act of Congress of 1992. Okay. It's not the Tibetan Policy Act. But just to clarify, technically, okay. that's okay. I, I mean, I, I, I read the uh, Tibetan Policy Act like numerous times. I think it reaffirms the position of that um, legislation. But getting back to the uh, original uh, question that here is a lot of people, especially in East Turkestan and in, in Tibet, and I've spoken to a lot of Tibetan youth about this um, issue, they don't view that... Um, you know, Tibet is an autonomous region in name, so is East Turkestan. But for the past 60 plus years that we've been an autonomous region, it has not brought us anything. It's only actually brought us more damage to where right now we're virtually on the brink of being annihilated by the Chinese communist regime. And as you see, the Chinese communist regime is going towards a more darker path. So... How is it that, how do you think that such a, like, advocating for, you know, genuine autonomy, how do you think that will, will be achieved when the Chinese Communist Party is relentless and just wants to completely assimilate and eradicate these people in, in Tibet and East Turkestan and other areas? That was a great question for Lobson Sengai, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> I can try, it, you know. We, we, we support the position of the democratically elected, you know, uh, uh, Tibetan authorities. Now, now the policies, uh, uh, we don't have like, this is not like the international campaign position. So uh, to say it's up to the Tibetans to decide, you know, uh, their position. Um, but I, I, I think I explained already, I think there is a deep conviction um, that, you know, 
geopolitically, you look at China and you're talking about uh, 1 billion, 400 million people. Um, and we are talking about 6 million Tibetans. We're talking about, you know, 20 million Uyghurs, I don't know exactly. Um, and you have countries like Nepal now or Bhutan who are, you know, between India, who's another 1 billion country. Um, so when you talk about independence, what are you really talking about? Um, are these countries that are militarily independent? Uh, like Nepal, no, it's just a rhetorical question. Uh, Bhutan, etc. So I think you have to look at, you know, are the rights, the cultural rights, the political rights, the civil rights guaranteed to the people? Uh, and do is the nation state the only way to guarantee that? For example, in Europe, where you have democracies, you have example of minorities. We have in Italy a German minority that have great uh, benefits, and they want to stay in Italy and not become, you know, independent or going back to uh, in Austria, you know, German-speaking minority. So uh, if there is a political will, I think autonomy can serve, uh, you know, the interest of, you know, coexistence among many people. The European Union is an idea where you, you know, bring people together in a broader, you know, uh, institutional architecture, even if you have different languages, histories, etc. Naturally, my feeling is that, you know, the autonomy, general autonomy for the Tibetan people would happen if China engages in the idea of political reforms, if that is a choice that they want to, uh, to achieve. But the fact that they are not willing to do that doesn't make the proposal you know, uh, wrong. So the, the problem is that if, you know, if China is not doing it, it's not that if you call for independence, that is going to change uh, China's position to engage in, uh, in more political reforms. I don't think so. I don't. I don't think so. I, I, that may be the way that Richmond would deal with, uh, you know, Northern Virginia succeeding from <laughs> Virginia, but I don't think that's the way the Chinese will react to a call for. Well, for, for a call for independence. I think when you look at what, what's, the, what's the alternative going to be, so far the situation in Hong Kong hasn't resolved itself. And, and there, there's a people that has um, a remarkable amount of freedom compared to what uh, Tibet and Xinjiang have. Uh, and, th and many of the protesters there have decided that they're going to push for the whole ball of wax. And, I think in the end they're probably going to end up with less than where they started, so I, I don't think I don't think that's a good strategy at all. But but it also gets it also gets to the concern I have about this current atmosphere here, bringing all these issues together and confusing them, and actually in the end hurting the cause of individual uh, ones of them. Uh, because, for instance, you could have someone who is an activist, a Uyghur activist, who, and we've been very supportive of Uyghur. Uh, rights as well, but you could see someone, you know, a, a movement of merging that then casts Tibetan causes in the same light, right? Or your causes start to be cast in the same light as Hong Kong's or, 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 or this sort of thing. Uh, on the other hand, there are some, and I wanted to ask Olivia about this, there are some uh, legitimate, uh, effective, uh, constructive ways to link the issue. There are commonalities in the way, that, especially in the way that we approach them. Where, where do you see those? Yeah, I mean, I think the challenge is in not like painting in broad brush strokes, right? I mean, U.S. policy has never benefited from lumping everything into one bucket and not being very specific and tailored in the particular solutions that we have to address the various challenges. Um, I don't think that Hong Kong and Xinjiang and Tibet should all be lumped together, um, but I do think that you know, one mechanism of U.S. policy that has been really strong during this administration has been the promotion of religious freedom, and that has seemed to tie a lot of people together. One of the challenges, though, as I referenced in my remarks, is that, you know, if you have human rights issues principally being led by offices like the Religious Freedom Office or Human Trafficking Office or even the Democracy Rights and Labor Bureau, when they're separated from the regional bureaus, it 
it decreases the effectiveness and the integration of those issues into broader overarching policy because it has the unintended consequence, I don't think this is an intended consequence, unintended consequence of sidelining the issue and siloing it. And so you lose the bear of critical thinking of individuals who are thinking about the other security issues and how they tie together. So that would be my solution. Not, I don't think we're going to get a State Department overhaul, and that's not even necessarily what I'm asking for. But I do think that there is a need to cross-pollinate on some of these issues and to not overstate connections between human rights and security issues where they don't exist or human rights and economic issues where they don't exist. But in the areas where they do, we should be seeing if we can make some of those policy mechanisms that are more familiar to a State Department security-minded person like targeted financial measures or otherwise and see if we can get forward traction on that. Yeah, I, th I think we also have to be mindful of how much the U.S. in the end is really going to be able to do. There's extraordinary amount we can do. The various pieces of legislation yeah. we've talked about uh, the rhetorical support. Uh, but if we want to, in Washington, encourage and push maximalist positions, mm -hmm. where will we be when it hits the fan? Okay. Mm -hmm. in, in any one of these cases, we're probably not deploying to Tibet. Yeah, I'm of course. Just, just telling you. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I think you have to kind of, it, whether it's Tibet or, or it's uh, Xinjiang or wherever it is, you've got to kind of think about that uh, longer term uh, challenge and put it in some context. Um, we went well over time. I want to thank you very much for being here, Matteo. It's always good to see you, and we're, we're very pleased to have you on the stage. Please join me in thanking Matteo and Olivia. Thank you.